we are training the next generation to meet the strategic challenges of tomorrow. We are dedicated to understanding in order to act better. Merci, rebonjour à tous et toutes. Nous allons reprendre. Thank you. Welcome Bienvenue. back, everyone. We will resume. So welcome to the second panel, cooperating with our rivals in a post-pandemic world. My name is Jonathan Paquin, professor at the Political Sciences Department of Laval University, also in charge of the first uh, uh, pillar of strategic analysis uh, of the network of strategic analysis. And we have four uh, speakers that will have something very interesting to tell us today. So allow me a few words of introduction for them and you will find the full di uh, bio in the, their, in the documents, in the material that you have. Before I do introduce them, please, Fill in this sheet with your personal information. You will find them on the tables and take the time, please, to write legibly. You will be picking them up at the end of this panel. And there, I said it. So firstly, in order of uh, speech, Zachary Pakin. He's a researcher in EU foreign policy at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, also a non-resident research fellow at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy in Toronto, as well as senior visiting fellow at the Global Policy Institute in London. Our second speaker is Serjan Vucetic, is an associate professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs and co-director in the Canadian Defence and Security Network. Before joining the schools, Surgeon was Randall Dillard Research Fellow in International Studies at Pembroke College at the University of Cambridge. And sitting next to him, Dr. Gaël Rivard Piché, who is a, a strategic analyst with Defence Research and Development Canada, working closely with the Canadian Armed Forces as a defence a defense scientist. She supports uh, the decision-making process of the Canadian Armed Forces. And lastly, Major General Ian Huddleston. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, General. Thank you for your indulgence. Major General uh, was selected uh, to study at the Royal uh, College of Defense Studies in, in 2015. And then he when he returned, he became the Director of Fleet Readiness at One Canadian Air Division Headquarters in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So we will proceed as we did this morning. I have a certain number of questions to put to our panelists, and they, of course, will answer in either French or English. Uh, try to be as concise as possible. With one little difference this afternoon, once uh, our panelists will have answered the first question, they will be able to um, actually uh, speak up and uh, in agreement, disagreement, or comment of the other panelists' uh, 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 interventions as well. So hope, hopefully it'll go well. Uh, and if it's war after the qu second question, there will be no, no longer this right of uh, interruption. So in the post-pandemic world, uh, the Can Canada is, is facing many international issues and challenges and upheavals that have uh, uh, affected us in the last few years and what has happened in the area of a COVID pandemic has reminded us that international dynamics change, not always in our favor, but much before COVID, there were signals there uh, internationally indicating that Canada was more and more alone and had to make strategic significant strategic decisions. And of course, it was isolated commercially with Donald Trump, where our main economic partner became our rival to some extent. And we can think of what he said about NATO, what Trump said about the uh, uh, NAFTA, the peer, the, the worst uh, deal in the story of the United States. Uh, 
two pillars of our foreign policy. And then there was COVID and the whole business about masks. Uh, Trump administration had asked 3M to cease exporting N95 masks to Canada. And that's when we realized that it was m more of a zero-sum game with our uh, U.S. partner. Uh, and then when Biden arrived, we felt things would change, perhaps a return to normal, and that has to be defined, of course. But economically, uh, Joe Biden announced his colors all too clearly and continues the protectionistic policies of the Trump administration, but with a smile. And in parallel with this tense and complex partnership with the U.S., there's Russia and China who are uh, increasingly menacing. And if you read the papers these days, you are aware that what's happening at the Ukrainian border and uh, in around Taiwan in its air defense zone, these are determining conflicts. And our response will be key. Will be key. Also, uh, there is an erosion of democracy. Freedom House now places the U.S. on an equal footing with Poland and Hungary in this regard. So that's quite incredible when one thinks that the U.S. played such a key role in democratizing Eastern Europe in the '90s, and now they're about on the same footing. So, uh, as uh, as Lenin used to say what to do what should we do what should canada do facing such numerous challenges and broadly how should canada respond how should it behave vis-a-vis -vis authoritarian regimes that obviously do not share canadian values what do we do do we stiffen our resolve or or, or reach out? What's the best strategy? So here's the first question, and then I will be quiet. The first question, what type of strategy should Canada or can Canada deploy uh, militarily, economically, politically to deal with, uh, uh, well, to be able to promote its values and principles with these states that do not share its values and principles. So starting in 2022, maybe in order of presentation, I would like to begin with Zachary Pakin. You have the floor. Thank you, Jonathan, can you hear me? Thank you, Jonathan, it's really a pleasure to be with you. Uh, you've been on this uh, research uh, theme for a year or two. Time flies. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Justin, for inviting me to the symposium. I'm grateful to be a part of this network. To answer the question, uh, first, I'd like to talk about how we should address these questions and think of them. Firstly, I think it would be worth it that Canada should think in terms of its interests in turn, rather than in terms of threats or challenges, because the latter is from the outside in. It's easy to look at the world and say, well, we got threats, we got challenges, and we have to rebalance this. <clears throat> However, if you start from the inside and head out conceptually, what are our interests? Our properly Canadian interests in a changing world order that might change some threats into opportunities. Also help us prioritize some of these, uh, some of the challenges on the list. That's the first thing. Uh, secondly, I'd like to distinguish between dialogue with rival powers on the one hand and these are economic sanctions and how to deal with situations that we disagree with. As for sanctions, we can debate uh, whether or not they have uh, brought about any behavioral change in China or Russia in recent years. But this type of dialogue is not what we should consider a, a reward for good behavior or punishment for bad behavior. Dialogue must continue. Regardless, conditions keep changing regionally, globally, in the Eastern Mediterranean, 
we, we see coalitions ever changing between Turkey, Egypt, Greece, and, and so on, Italy and France. Uh, also, uh, the configuration of the powers in that region compared to what it was a year or two ago is completely different. So if one ceases dialogue, one limits our opportunities to identify some opportunities for collaboration where we may have interests in common. So uh, having said that, I'd like to set it aside and I have a couple of things to deal with about with Russia and China in particular. Firstly, I think it's worth avoiding to place avoiding placing these two powers in the same basket. Yes, of course, they are both authoritarian uh, powers. Uh, Russia is increasingly so, uh, and they don't share our values, and we see them as being opposed to the international liberal order, whatever it means, but we can talk about that. And it's easy to divide the world in a binary fashion like that. But in reality, there are great differences between Russia and Chinese objectives, domestic systems, uh, national systems, etc. But one has to take into account the special geography of Canada and its interests based on the geography, our interests, will be different uh, to theirs. Chinese is a growing power. Our economies are more integrated than, than it is, than ours is with Russia. So Canada's strategy inevitably will uh, deal with them differently. It's easier to identify how a rising China poses a challenge for Canada than it is uh, for Russia. In the case of Russia, we disagree, obviously, on how to uh, deal with European security. That's 100% true. NATO is an important pillar of Canada's foreign policy as well. But in terms of our geography, Canada is not directly threatened by uh, Russia. As well in the Arctic, one could see that military capabilities of Russia are growing. This doesn't mean, however, that it's a revisionist posture uh, on their part, because Russia's interest at, at the end of the day is to maintain the status quo in the region, have development in the region, and use it as a base for exporting from Russia to the rest of the world. And then in the case of uh, Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific, Russia's foreign policy and towards Eurasia in general is much less of a zero-sum game than it is towards Euro, the Euro-Atlantic re region. So Canada is a country that is facing all three, Europe, the Arctic, and Asia. And it's also the case for Russia, which is present in these three regions. So I think it's worth it for Canada to be able to distinguish our relations with Russia in these three uh, geographic realities. Of course, uh, in Europe, we, we won't agree on NATO, uh, but in the other areas, the Arctic, it's a matter of scientific cooperation, collaboration, but in Asia Pacific, there are opportunities for a strategic dialogue. I think it's worth trying at least, identifying some of the interests we may have in common. And lastly, for China, I think that, well, lots of pundits, even those who are not foreign uh, affairs scholars, media people, etc., have been talking about uh, the Quad and the uh, economic uh, embargo and, and the, and the uh, AUKUS and, and the fact that Canada is not part of it, and as 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 if the measure of success was being part of something that the U.S. is part of, we have our own interests. Uh, even if we were invited to AUKUS, we don't have much to offer militarily in the Indo-Pacific domain. So, for Canada, the greatest question for us with respect to China is the CPTPP, uh, and. Uh, for ch China to be part of that free trade agreement, in particular because Canada is the second economy of that accord. 
And even the the Meng to Michael situation, in spite of that, uh, is not an opportunity to is not opportune doesn't make it opportune to just reject China's candidacy uh, out of hand. In term, in economic terms, uh, given the political difficulties and the protectionist difficulties that we now face in the U.S., it is worth it for Canada to position itself as a country that can uh, bring forward its interests on this matter of the economy. How can we build a regional order in the Indo-Pacific domain that is inclusive and certainly having certain common rules and standards is worth it. It's worth negotiating with a firm and resolute uh, posture towards China. But nonetheless, we need to start thinking now on that. And if we don't, this will be a missed opportunity, I think. If China doesn't want to bring forth its uh, economic reform to join the club, well, then that's one thing. But it's worth, uh, I think, beginning this process. And Japan would agree with that. And they would also wholeheartedly agree with having a certain dialogue with Russia, the region. J Japan is usually aligned with the U.S., limiting its sanctions towards Russia and maintaining strategic dialogue. Japan is certainly a major partner for Canada in this region. We use the same vocabulary of free and open Indo-Pacific. So if we could position ourselves in the same way as Japan in the region and know how to work together to create this more inclusive order than in the vocab that we one finds in Washington, I think it would be worth it for us and it would advance our own position in the region where we've been absent for uh, quite long, quite a long period of time. Sirjan, hello everyone. Firstly, I'm delighted to, to be here. I'd like to thank Stephanie and Justin for inviting me and Jonathan for the introduction. Um, I know I only have five minutes. I think it would be a, a good idea to to start with a statistical overview of Canada's uh, voting position in the, the United Nations General Assembly. I think it's an interesting starting point because uh, Carrie Buck said that today is the beginning of the Summit for Democracy organized by President Biden in Washington. And uh, this analysis is based on an article that I co-wrote with a Simon Fraser colleague. The Institute of Peace and Diplomacy is a little blog that we have. Canada Among Democracies is the title. Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. I'll just say this quickly. Uh, the world, uh, our world today, uh, looks kind of like our world in 2014, uh, 2015. So this is before Trump, before uh, Brexit, before some of the things we're discussing uh, today. And you see the world divided into three. Uh, the largest world is the so-called rest. G77, the non-aligned, the formerly known as non-aligned, the rest of the world. So that's, th those are the countries kind of like China and Russia and those who vote alongside China and Russia most of the time on most issues uh, in most, on most resolutions in the United Nations General Assembly. Then we have the West, uh, which is a kind of Europeans plus East Asian democracies. And then you'll have the United States and its friends, uh, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Palau, uh, and Israel. And Canada is hovering in 2014-15 between the West and the U.S. version of the West. Uh, and so that was 
That was then. And then things, this is interesting, right? Because many of us kind of cut our teeth in Canadian foreign policy stu uh, studies writing on the so-called Harper break in Canadian foreign policy where our foreign policy priorities changed in, in many ways and this included voting in the UN uh, General Assembly. So what about, uh, what about under uh, Justin Trudeau, right? What about uh, the first early kind of years of, of the Trudeau government? Has, has our voting changed at all? Well, it turns out in, not in the first year, uh, not in the first two, two years, in fact. You see Canada exactly where it was under Harper. Um, and why you could say, well, uh, we changed our voting practices, especially in the Middle East under, uh, e even, even before Harper, right? Harper kind of confirmed certain trends. And then what happens is Trudeau simply continues. There is no change. Canada is not back in terms of our traditional voting pattern, which is to, to go with Western European states, Western European democracies, plus Japan, plus Australia, right? That would be the traditional kind of post-Cold War period. Um, no, right? We were much closer to the United States and its three amigos or four amigos. Um, so, but then things kind of, we decided to update this analysis a little bit. So this is based on a, on a paper that we did in Canadian uh, Journal of Political Science. I'm not going to go into methodology here at all, but you know, these are kind of these simple uh, maps of voting. And then, and then 2019, 2020, finally this change starts happening. We see that the, uh, the, the voting pattern uh, a, a GAC, well, or rather our ambassador at the, at the, U, uh, at the United Nations General Assembly, is, is, is changing the way how we vote in terms of tracking uh, certain countries over others. Canada is sort of moving away from the U.S. cluster towards uh, the West, uh, quote unquote, more and more. And, and so uh, what, what does that tell us? This is kind of the most recent uh, uh, data uh, and uh, the, the, the ends in March 31st uh, this year. And what we see is, uh, yes, you could argue that uh, we are finally back when it comes to this very small thing, which is voting in the United Nations General Assembly, in terms of, uh, I guess, recovering this, this new old voting pattern. Now, what does this really mean? Well, it's hard to know without interviewing people who actually work for GAC and maybe, you know, PMO, <laughs> which will never happen, of course, but at some point, historians will, will find out, you know, what are the conditions under which we decided to kind of switch uh, what, what seemed to be lasting practices uh, in terms of uh, voting in the United Nations General Assembly. Um, this is important uh, as, as a kind of broad context because uh, what's happening today and tomorrow is the Summit for Democracy, which is a really interesting idea. It's maybe 100 years old, and it, it went over, I mean, it, when, when the Biden-Harris ticket went, you know, became public and, and, and the, the campaign managers started to come up with the foreign policy visions, this was Biden's number one idea uh, uh, when it comes to foreign policy. Let's, let's do uh, a summit of democracies. Then the managers say, well, maybe we shouldn't be talking about democracy right now, given what we've gone through with Trump. Then they change off to for democracy, right? Uh, but it's an idea that used to be, I guess, uh, part of safe space in American politics. Why? Because Senator John McCain, as well as uh, Bill Clinton, uh, as president, as well as State Secretary Madeleine Albright uh, and, and Hillary Clinton, as well as State Secretary Anthony Blinken at one point, even Bernie Sanders and Senator thought this would be a good idea to have some kind of a league or a concert or, or a community of democracies. So it used to be, a, it occupied safe space in US politics. It's not so clear anymore, I would say. Uh, why? Well, we talked a lot about China here, and, and that's absolutely true. But if I was, if I was giving an exam, a comprehensive exam uh, in, uh, to, 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 to students right now, I'd give them this question. What, what's, what's more threatening to Canada? The rise of China or the rise of, what do we want to call it, uh, authoritarian nationalist populism in the world. And that includes that in the United States. Obviously, we talked about both issues. But if you were to put your money on, on an answer, wh where would it be? What, what's more threatening right now? And, you know, China, obviously, we, we can talk about that forever, and we should, and we will. Uh, but the idea that what's happening on the political right in the United States uh, is is f I, I think far more far more concerning to us 
we have, what, we, what we're seeing uh, is the division on the right, not just in the United States, globally, between those who think that liberal democracy is passe. And uh, there's, a, there's been a civil war in the, in, in the Republican Party in the United States for a very long time. And I would say those who argue that January 6th is nothing, is, is not even worth discussing anymore, are stronger than those so-called principal conservatives or never Trumpers who think that this is an all too close call for American democracy. And how this is playing out is going to be the most perhaps interesting geopolitical, geoeconomic, however you want to call it, question of the next, uh, of the next five years. And uh, when it comes to Canada and Canadian strategy, we, we need to have two strategies. We need, we need to have the Biden strategy or the Democrat strategy and the strategy if, 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 if the first strategy does not operate as advertised. And, and, and I think uh, my GSPIA uh, colleague, senior fellow, uh, back was correct to say um, we need to build state capacity in Canada. I'm not exactly arguing for Brexit from North America, <laughs> although some of my arguments in print have been interpreted in that way. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that means doing exactly those four things that, 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 that Madame Bach discussed this morning uh, and, and following them to the letter. I mean, I really have little to add uh, to what she said. I'm not saying this because we're in the same school, uh, but because I really subscribe uh, to, to this thinking, and I hope we're going to get to, to discuss them at, at, at some length. And I'll stop here for that reason. <laughs> Thank you, Sergeant. Thank, Thank you very much. Gaëlle? Oui, d'abord, euh, merci beaucoup pour l'invitation. C'est un plaisir d'être au ici aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup pour m'inviter. Je suis très heureuse d'être sur ce panel aujourd'hui. Je veux aussi dire que, comme uh, représentant du Défense du Département, je ne suis pas ici pour présenter les vues du Département. Je suis plus un in-house uh, science advisor, si vous voulez. So I'd like to echo what my colleagues on the panel have said, as well as what Mrs. Buck indicated, that Canada must uh, express its interest. And I'd like to think about our strategic interest, because before asking what kind of strategy we need to put in place in order to work with our rival states, with our adversaries, first of all, we need to ask what our strategic interests are, what are we defending, and what matters to Canada, similar to what we just heard. So I believe that Canada no longer has the luxury of confusing values and strategic interests. And I'm not saying that strategic interests are not influenced by our values, but they're not the same thing. We have to be careful here because sometimes when we promote our values, we act counter to our actual strategic interests. It's important to identify both so that we can then take uh, wise decisions. and. Uh, the environment is becoming more and more difficult on a strategic and operational level for our armed forces. So having clearly defined strategic interests not only allows us to prioritize, but to develop strategies that will be more coherent in the long term. That's why when we have clear strategic interests, these interests don't necessarily change. It's how we implement them, how we promote them and protect them that will change over time. So Canada's strategic interests are really those elements that directly or indirectly affect the likelihood of a, an attack against Canada. When you see them through that, it allows us to really set a clear and well-defined list of priorities. And uh, I don't think to surprise anybody, but this begins with sovereignty, integrity, and social cohesion of Canada. So to achieve this, not only we have to deter, but we need to defend ourselves against conventional attacks, but any hostile actions, and we have to counter foreign interference. Increasingly, we're hearing about David Guignol, the director who spoke uh, over the last few years on the topic. I think we need to do a better job in making public, but to have a national dialogue on threats that are emerging and that Canada is facing, not only abroad, but here in-house on our own in our own country. And the second strategic interest is our alliance with the United States, and we're going to revisit that on, Canada, on the panel, but that will be key to Canada's prosperity and security. But I think we have to tackle this issue. We must not take this for granted. And thirdly, and that's a conversation we had this morning, what do we do to maintain a well-functioning international order? Canada must maintain its institutions that have been beneficial for us for decades, and we must maintain them because 
it also is important to replace the position of the United States in the international order. But on the international level, we need to adopt a strong positioning for Canada where we will be able to cooperate and dialogue with our partners internationally, an international system where Canada has no longer a voice, where it can no longer dialogue with Tehran, with Moscow, with others, is a state where we're no longer able to defend our interests and truly will be, be, will be sidelined. And in fact, this will undermine our national security and national defense. So when we're thinking long-term from the viewpoint of engagement with rival states, I think we need to be much more forward. We need to identify issues and questions on which dialogue is possible. We may not necessarily have the same position, but we have to be more innovative in our approach to these relations. So that's across governments. But we also need to do this as a society because we're seeing more and more two-track uh, diplomacy, but we're also, we therefore need to have an approach that brings together all of these components as well we have to left, leave aside uh, positions of principles that don't serve our interests. It doesn't mean we stop promoting our values, but in some cases we have to wonder whether or not international denouncements or the withdrawal from certain agreements or the refusal to take part in a number of forums is perhaps only sidelining us. I also believe that we have to take into the fact that the international system, international relations are not a zero sum game. And by finding common issues uh, that don't necessarily need to be military, but maybe in other sectors will in the long term enable us to protect our interests, but especially will uh, safeguard the position of Canada internationally. Thank you very much. Hello, General. quite expect that uh, to have to uh, um, compete with but um, I'll first say uh, if General Haino's uh, watching uh, sir please turn off your uh, audio and uh, and disregard uh, me because I, I feel very humble uh, speaking with you online uh, General Haino one of our great uh, chiefs of defense uh, as, as you know um, I, I uh, this is my first time so I'm uh, I'm caught uh, having listened to the th my three colleagues um, with a couple of competing thoughts. And I haven't been quite so focused as they have in terms of preparing, but let me, uh, let me uh, say a few words and then I'll be very open to questions. I'd say that I'm, I'm very much of the opinion uh, that our strategy should be based on interests. And I'm very much, uh, and I very much share uh, Joanne's, uh, um, it's Joanna. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Gail. I, there was a Joanna. <laughs> Um, I, I, I very much uh, share Gail's um, perspective that our interests are not or should be delinked from our values or our projected values because they are not the same. Um, but I would, I would uh, go against uh, the idea uh, that uh, Trump uh, or the recent uh, political changes in the United States create some sort of dramatic division between Canada and the United States. They've protected us. Uh, and I say that very directly, they've protected us uh, for the past 70 years, and we've taken full advantage of that protection, um, and we've underinvested in many aspects of defense uh, with that umbrella uh, covering us uh, over in terms of the threats of the day. So to say that Trump, uh, even though uh, we may very much disagree with his policies, but to say that Trump somehow undermines that relationship or should undermine that relationship to me is uh, wrong-headed. Um, so in my mind, our key interests, I would say with Gail, uh, our key interests are sovereignty, integrity, and national cohesion. But the question is, how do we achieve that? And I think uh, you go back to the basics of, of national strategies, and they are supposed to, the national strategy is supposed to ensure the security, stability, and prosperity of the country. Um, and I think uh, you would agree with me that on the security side of things, uh, we've fallen somewhat short. And, and that is purely because of our dependence on the Americans, and then somewhat because of our dependence on the Five Eyes community and the larger NATO community. Um, and I think the significant change that's occurred 
over the last five to ten years is that China, both China and Russia, have developed capabilities that can threaten North America directly and in a matter of hours. So the Chinese and the Russians with hypersonic weapons, whether conventional or nuclear uh, armed, can hit any target in North America uh, within an hour or two of launch. So this is a game changer. And we, we don't have the, we don't have the uh, security or the time to consider whether China or Russia should be better friends or not. They are, peer comp they are competitors. They're peer competitors with the US. They are very much not a peer competitor of ours. Um, and our only interest, in my mind, lies in uh, supporting the alliances that exist currently. Uh, we've been excluded from the newest one, AUKUS. Um, uh, and I think um, part of the reason that we see uh, Biden, and this is just conjecture on my part, but part of the reason we see Biden not warming up to us in quite the way we would expect is because Canada is not pulling its weight. And if we expect to be uh, treated as a true partner in, in, in the defense of the liberal democratic order, then I think we need to change something in that regard. The Chinese and the Russians, the other threat that the Chinese and the Russians pose is that gray zone that's below the thresh of, threshold of war. So I've said that uh, they can threaten our homeland. Now, homeland is an American term, generally speaking, but you get the sense. They can directly uh, attack any point on the North American continent within two hours, three hours, a three hour time frame. They can also dominate space. And, and if, if China is not a peer competitor with the US, um, it's almost there and it's uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a very robust and focused path to uh, bypass the United States as the premier power in space. And space dominates everything that we do on the surface of this earth. GPS, uh, Wikipedia, uh, everything is dominated by space and enabled by space. And the Chinese can threaten everything that we do in space, and the Russians can as well. So, so in my mind, it's, uh, the, the calculus is much simpler than, uh, than, than it might look. Um, it's that we are in a competition with two authoritarian powers uh, that do not share our values. So the question is, uh, are, we, are we happy with that situation? What do we want to do about it? And I would suggest to you that the only thing we can do about it is be stronger, better, uh, more aligned partners with our historic allies. Thank you, Major General. Um, we seem to have a consensus around the table to the effect that the values and interests are two different things. We have to stop confusing our values with our interests. In fact, that was a criticism that uh, uh, Harbin, Harper made often vis-a-vis -vis his predecessors. Obviously, researchers, uh, ac academics have the luxury of criticizing governments and they're never called on to make decisions. So let me push a little bit on this issue of values and interests. And that wasn't planned, but uh, up to you to intervene or to correct me. So let's say uh, we're facing a well-known situation. That is the Olympic Games of Beijing, our prime minister, announced yesterday that there would be a diplomatic boycott of the Olympics. And the Uyghur situation. À mes yeux, c'est une question de valeur. In my mind, that is valid as reasoning. However, has the prime minister dissociated values with interest? And had you been in his place, given what you have just outlined to us, what would you have done? Si quelqu'un veut intervenir. Okay. If somebody would like to speak. Now in February, it will have been eight years since uh, the beginning of the Ukraine uh, crisis when Russia went into Ukraine, which occurred just a few months after, after the Olympic Games. And I believe that if at the time, uh, then Mr. Hollande and Mr. Obama went there. If they had not undertaken a diplomatic boycott of Russia, which was 
unofficially the case. It was an official announced as such. So if they had gone, I think they would have had the opportunity to have a meeting at the Olympic Village and then to come out and say is that we have a problem. There is a threat and there are events taking place in Ukraine for weeks now. So together, how can we find a solution to this? And I'm not saying that a crisis would not have occurred, but at the very least, they would have been able to better manage this. Now, eight years later, we find ourselves in, in a similar situation where Russia is once again threatening Ukraine. And again, uh, we know that the relations between uh, China and Russia are closer. Again, there might be an opportunity for us. Uh, uh, there's a chance that there might be a war on two levels. And I think the United States would not be able to win this because the they don't absolute have absolute power, world power. So it really is very local and relative. So what Russia can do or what China can do in Taiwan, it can be much quicker and they can have a much greater impact on the ground than what the United States could do. So personally, would I have conducted a diplomatic boycott? No, honestly, I think that's a missed opportunity to address the security issue in the Southern China Sea. I don't know what's going to happen in the coming months, but I think we should not miss out on the opportunity of dialoguing. In any case, if this is a value for Canada, then we won't be there either. We can't simply say we will see our minister and so on, but let's all simply sit back and watch this on TV because it's, it's very important to, after all, watch the hockey match. But if there are human rights abuses in China, we're not going to send anybody there to uh, compete. So there's a bit of hypocrisy in this. So I don't know if I'll have an opportunity to answer something that somebody else mentioned, but I completely agree with Gail with the comments made. And I'd like to add something to the issue of uh, the rules-based international order. I don't know if it's the international rules-based order or the existence of a order of that kind in Canada based on rules. Because it's a good idea for us not to mix up the idea of having general rules with the fact that the United States is and has been the dominant power internationally for decades and is playing a very important role in designing these rules. So the question is, uh, which rules and the rules for whom? Because we've often seen that powers like Russia and China are not against the idea of having an international rules-based order, but the notion is whose rules and who's allowed to make up these rules. So China's current position is that they want to benefit from the same privileges and follow the example of the United States. They've been wanting to do this to become a major power. That is China wants to be able to draft those rules for other states and they'll follow the rules that China has played a role in playing but it also wants to reserve itself the right to not to follow those rules from time to time, as we've seen in the United States, so when this uh, serves its own interests. So I think this brings us back to the issue of how we see the current international order. And I think that we have addressed this a little bit in the, the previous uh, session with uh, Ambassador Kerry Buck. So are we going to confuse multilateralism and general rules with the international contemporary order. Are those the same things? Are the rules and multilateralism, are they just part of the international order? And there's the other side. For example, we have the relations between the major powers, this multipolarity in the management of the international order. Uh, the international community or system. So, I think we need to keep these factors in mind. And again, a last point, uh, and uh, I'll, I think the general has left. I was going to say something to him, so we'll do that after. Gail? Or Surgeon? I feel, I feel robbed. Uh, no, no, I, it's, 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 a, it's a great point. I, I think what Zach is saying uh, is, is very important. I, I think few of us think that there's, going to be some kind of renaissance of the liberal international order circa 2015. 
That, th those days are not coming back, right? So the question then, so wh wh what are we seeing? What are we faced with? Uh, one option is the Cold War. We use it as a metaphor a lot, uh, again. Madame Buck said, not your grandmother's Cold War. It's true, right? It's not as ideological as the Cold War uh, was, and it's unlikely to be as ideological. But there's something there, right? There's a division going on. There's decoupling, even in international political economy, which we're not discussing today. We're all security kind of leaning folk. Um, but, you know, if we, if we were to bring in a bunch of uh, uh, finance folks, uh, economists, and so on, they, they, they'd be identifying things that, that, that kind of push us in the Cold War direction. And the other option is, of course, of course uh, multipolarity, right? Which is probably more likely uh, world in which you know, we're gonna be living in. I mean, this is the subject of the uh, book Justin and uh, Jonathan edited, uh, to which I contributed happily a chapter. And, and that's really true, right? The, the American power is declining relatively to the rest. Uh, what does that mean for the allies? Well, usually it means you're hedging your bets, to use another concept uh, from uh, IR theory. Now, you know, do we get to hedge in Canada? That's a big question. It's always been a question. It's been a question since the founding of Canada, right? It's our ontological condition, to use another IR word. <laughs> um, and, and so we don't really have an option. I, mean, I, I actually very much uh, agree with Major General Hudson. I, I, I think I, I think that one way or another, even if the US were to become some kind of illiberal democracy, we, we'd probably have to you know, suck it up. And, and see how exactly our values and interests uh, are mutually reconstituted under that. Uh, I think it would be extremely challenging because I, I, I think you can't have one without the other, uh, living uh, in, a, in a world in which our allies are led by you know, more politic pro-Trump or Trumpist politicians would, would, I think, fundamentally raise some questions about who we are, what we want to be in the world. So again, values and interests. And, and I think ethnocentric racist appeals to the nation and nationalism are, we see them, they're simmering under the surface of every democracy in the world right now. Perhaps not in Canada, I, I, I think most, com the commentary in the country is correct to say we have a lot of reasons to be proud of uh, at the current summit for democracy because, you know, <laughs> we're not some of the <laughs> invitees that whose you know, credentials are being questioned. So Poland, the Philippines, Pakistan is you know, invited. So that, you know, Canada is on the opposite end of that conversation. And that's great. But imagine a world in which you know, it's OK to call countries such as the Philippines, I don't know, Serbia, democracies. Well, that changes. I think that changes the calculus. And, and, and I think investing in state capacity, and by that I mean totally investing in defense. I'm not a pacifist is the right thing to do. I mean, it's just basic insurance. Whatever the strategy is, we need to invest more, and not just in defense, but you know, whole of government. And of course, if I was on the left, I'd say whole of planet approach. But that's not what we're talking about, right? Whole of government <laughs> is probably the, 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 right, uh, the, the right thing to say. Uh, just quickly about uh, the five eyes. Absolutely, it's the most functional intelligence uh, pact uh, in history. But what's happened to the five eyes in the last I would say five years, but m maybe we can make an academic argument and say it's been going on for a very long time, is the diplomatization of this intelligence alliance. It's also become a human rights alliance. So when, when the United States and the UK and then Australia say we're boycotting, you, can, you, you, know, you know Canada is, is gonna follow, and New Zealand is next. I, and I'm making a prediction, so Thanks. I'll stop there. Gail? Uh, pour moi, la décision en fait, qui a été prise euh, de boycotter en fait la participation diplomatique aux Jeux Olympiques, c'était vraiment une, une décision qui parle beaucoup décision de notre relation avec les États-Unis, justement avec nos alliés rapprochés, et aussi je pense que c'est une décision. Et a été appréciée domestiquement quand nous considérons le public. The, the prevailing public opinion about China after the two Michaels affair. Uh, I think it's more of a decision about our allies and our population than towards our rival. However, one point I'd like to make is that there was much talk of, about if the exclusion of Canada from the new tri tripartite alliance, AUKUS. One of the reasons why we need strategic interests is to prioritize. From the standpoint of planning defense, we can't do everything all the time. We don't have the resources to do that. Canada cannot be everywhere promoting this and that. 
and that's the idea of having strategic priorities. The tripartite alliance is focused on the Pacific region. And for Canada, that's not necessarily where, I, where our strategic uh, interests are the most keenly threatened. Yes, we're on the outside of an alliance that includes key partners, but not, it's not in a region where our Canadian strategic interests were uh, so important to promote. If it had been in the Arctic, then Canada would have been a key player. But in the Pacific, considering our limits and the other priorities and places where we're engaged, I don't think that we can open militarily on a fourth region without um, major consequences on our forces that are already pressed to meet our commitments elsewhere. For the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. Um, I, I think on a personal level, uh, uh, and, it, and it ties back to uh, what I see as, um, as uh, China's use of the games. China's using the games to uh, showcase um, itself uh, within the rules rules based international order and from a military perspective i see them sitting uh, very much outside the rules based international order when you impose your will on the south china sea and uh, and uh, create bases and uh, infrastructure out of nothing uh, when you threaten on a nearly daily basis to invade a, uh, a neighboring country uh, although it's not recognized as a country uh, I see that as sitting outside of the rules-based international order. So um, I think, unfortunately, the Beijing Olympics gives them a platform to counter that narrative. Um, and my personal opinion is that we shouldn't be participating in it. Um, there was, in, a, in an article, there was um, uh, something that went further than that, uh, suggesting uh, that the Olympics was, was starting to have that flavor where uh, authoritarian nations were the ones that were able to afford the Olympics and that maybe we should change the whole model moving forward. I'm not expert on that, but it was interesting anyways, and I'd, and I'd uh, recommend that as something that you could read from an academic point of view. Um, in terms of uh, focus on the Indo-Pacific, uh, yes, I'd agree that the Indo-Pacific is not a... Um, it, it may be wrong to over-prioritize the Indo-Pacific. I think the Arctic for Canada is more um, important. However, uh, don't forget that uh, two of the major North American container ports are in Canada, Va Vancouver and Prince Rupert. And the, uh, I, I don't have the statistics, but Admiral Octoloni would be able to tell you uh, that they're very significant mm -hmm. in terms of Canada's overall uh, economic uh, GDP. So safe passage, uh, the rules-based international order existing in the South China Sea and the Indo-Pacific is actually very much an interest of ours. And I would say that the, um, the fact that we've uh, not been made part of the, uh, tri um, the, the AUKUS uh, group is, is significant in, in, in another reason, in another way. So Five Eyes traditionally has been an intelligence sharing orga um, organization or, or um, alliance that sits below the threshold of NATO. Um, but remember that we're moving towards a, um, a world where operations in the gray zone, specifically in cyberspace, are uh, cyberspace is really becoming the battlefield, and it and it is today. Uh, there are there are. Uh, kinetic, what we would call kinetic uh, cyber activities going on today, but on a, uh, not, not attributable. Um, and AUKUS is as much about nuclear submarines as it is about advanced technologies of other types. Um, and I would, I would suggest that Canada cannot afford, if we are, as I argued previously, to be a better, uh, stronger, more committed, more aligned partner, uh, we cannot afford uh, to uh, not be engaged in those technological uh, advancements. Thank you. Zach, you have the final word. Uh, if I could just uh, respond to something that the general brought up about uh, China's intentions and how we should you know, view China's uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the rules-based international order. 
you know, we, we see the United States criticize China about you know, island, island construction in the South China Sea and that this violates principles related to freedom of navigation and, and you know, established maritime borders, etc. And yet the United States itself is not a party to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, you know, you see, uh, you know, for example, you know, the United States criticizing China about, you know, the potential threat that it poses to, to Taiwan, and yet at the same time, you know, you have a United States that over recent decades, you know, redrew the borders of Yugoslavia unilaterally against international law, invaded the, you know, you know invaded Iraq against international law, overthrew the Gaddafi regime in Libya without a mandate from the UN Security Council to do so. You know, you see a, a United States that, that tells China that it needs to respect human rights and yet itself drone bombs civilians in various different countries. I'm, I'm not here to justify anything here. I'm just sort of saying that, you know, China basically sees this and thinks that the United States is using these pronouncements to keep it down and to weaken it rather than actually believing in those pronouncements in and of themselves. And that leads to a problem right there. So I, I think that the, as it relates to the rules-based international order question, Right? It, it, it's very tempting for us always to want to divide, to divide the world into status quo powers and revisionist powers. And we see the United States as the established hegemon and the established defender of the existing order and, and powers like Russia and China as revisionist powers. But I think that the better way of looking at it is that the rules of the future international order have yet to be written. And therefore, in a certain sense, all three major powers, the US, Russia, and China, are all revisionist to a degree and all want to write those rules. And that's the competition that you're sort of seeing playing out, uh, you know, right now. But in the meantime, you know, regularly hectoring China about its need to, you know, uh, adhere to the rules-based international order, I don't think that's, that's going to get us anywhere. Uh, it, it's unfortunate that the term rules-based international order, which should be a, a neutral term, has become such a, you know, political football. But it, it's, it's just the reality. And so it, I think it's very hard to avoid the question of what rules whose rules, what kind of order is it going to be, is it going to be an inclusive one or not, and if it's not an inclusive one, then we are inviting, in effect, a permanent state of confrontation between great powers, which I don't think is necessarily in, in Canada's interest. So, you know, especially because we're, you know, a, a trading power and, you know, the, the, the so-called Indo-Pacific region is increasingly the center of global economic activity. So I think we have to think long and hard about whether or not we in Canada share the same interests of the, as the United States vis-a-vis -vis the question of China. doesn't mean that we don't have certain issues where we're going to need to push back on China. That We absolutely do. Uh, but we need to be very, very careful whether or not we want to just take these, you know, American, uh, you know, this American sort of uh, think tank jargon that's, that's, you know, regularly present in Washington and then repeat it sort of mindlessly in Canada as if it also reflects our own interests when in reality we have our own and we need to come up with our own vocabulary and our own vision of, of our regional interests. Gay, you have the final, final. The final, final. Referring to. Kerry Buck's presentation. I think we will have more and more forum shopping internationally, and that will also apply in defense relations and alliances. And this is my prediction. We will have alliances that are less um, uh, set in stone and vary more. If for Canada it's important to be part, and I agree with you, to uh, the tri tripartite alliance, but we have to have something to bring to the table. Since we're not having a national uh, conversation on our uh, capacity in the area of nuclear submarines capability, so what can we bring to this alliance? And we should have that conversation nationally because our uh, operational environment is changing rapidly. What can we bring to the table in these new alliances that will make us a preferable and credible ally. Thank you. Thank you. Zach set the table wonderfully a few minutes ago for the second question of the day. Our second topic is the following strategic or autonomy. Should Canada increase its autonomy? How much does it have from the United States? It's difficult to talk about Canadian foreign policy without addressing the United States, main economic, strategic partner, commercial partner. And under Trump in particular, we had a bit of a psychological shock here. We realized that US democracy, this the, that of this ally that's so important to us was in mutation, transforming. And, uh, you know, uh, that a Trumpist in the White House in 2025 is not an impossibility at all. Before I put the question to you, I'd like 
to review a little his story that had an impact on me two or three years ago. I did a study on member with members of the Congress on their knowledge of Canada, and I was able to meet some Trumpists. One of them did not have kind words for Canada. And I said, unfortunately, yes, but we have a special relationship. And he said, You should apply to become the 51st state of the United States of America. Canada and China are two sovereign countries. I don't see why it would be different for Canada. Uh, so, ça c'est une discussion. J'en ai eu d'autres. So c'est vrai que c'est anecdotique. Pas... I had others. It's Mais, an uh, anecdotal. Mais donc, ça... but it certainly slightly changed my perception of of reality. And this is where I want to bring you. We're used to thinking with the United States. Uh, I'm a bit provocative. And I ask my students, are we a sovereign country? Somebody says, yes, it's a statute of Westminster 1931. I said, great, but the Canada is systematically aligned with, uh, with the US on everything. The studies show this. Uh, when we never talk about foreign policy in electoral debates. We talk about provincial matters. Do we have a foreign policy? Do we behave like a fully sovereign country or a semi-sovereign country? So this is where I'd like to bring you. Does Canada have the means to behave autonomously without the United States, or at the very least, to have more strategic space without systematically turning towards the United States to obtain its approval in the order, uh, as, same as previous? Please limit your responses to five minutes. Zach. If you look at it over the long term, it depends on the choice we're going to make. It has to be a consistent possible choice, or do we decide we want to be independent and are we going to lead international policy? And even though we may not always agree with our allies with the United States, do we stick to this? That's what's before us. If we decide that we want to be 100% there with the United States, that's fine. But if we decide that, let's not try to do everything at once. That's what we need to decide. You cannot continue to hold campaigns at the Security Council, at the UN, because we're already seen as an extension of the United States. Nor can we continue to say that we're a middle level country. That's the case. We're no longer that. We haven't been that for a while. If we decide that, fine, that's good. But once we have decided to do this, we need to uh, showcase some places that we can direct our resources to. And then if you look at the long term, we were to decide that it is in our interest right now to develop an intellectual strategic culture that is independent Canada, that is also good, but we truly need to make a choice. And I also believe that this decision must be developed by taking into account not only the resources, but the power of Canada. And this discourse that we often hear in Canada, which is really focused on the inside where the national identity of Canada that is not uh, really able to advance Canada's international interest, uh, interest internationally, that cannot continue. We are in a world that is increasingly multipolar, so regional issues are becoming increasingly important because if to that you add the situation that we have a mutually assured destruction uh, system among uh, the major powers, uh, the ones who can use their rich military power are the regional ones and they are becoming more and more influential. Consider Iran and their number of players there as well. So we in Canada, we don't have a region at all. So we cannot really say that we're a regional power where we can apply all of our resources to a specific region, nor are we a middle power either because we have our diplomacy, international aid and all that has changed this. So I believe that this decision, either being independent or being on our own must be taken. I don't know when, but honestly, the first thing that we must do to 
ensure that we can make this decision is to assure that political parties in Canada can at the very least agree on these major issues that are, what are the interests of Canada? We don't see this. Uh, um, you have, when it comes to China, the two main parties hold completely different positions. They're almost at 100% polar opposites, whereas in the US, the Democrats and Republicans who disagree on everything, on cultural issues, the economy, and so on and so forth. But at the very least, when it comes to China, they completely agree because there is a threat, whether it be existential or other, but it is a major threat that exists in the United States. In Canada, we're not even there, nor do we have the opportunity or the liberty or the space to wait for this. And we cannot afford not to settle these issues. But in previous decades, we saw this as we saw different parties speak about this. There was a process that unfolded in Canada to identify Canada's interests. For example, 50 years ago, there was the identification of the third option. There was a process that lasted a long time and that was carried through within the context of a respect, a respect between the political parties. It's different today uh, from time to time. We hear about this. So we hear this in the House of Commons in Ottawa, and this is more symbolic in nature. We have the opposition parties that are starting to criticize the government for symbolic reasons and without thinking through the consequences that this may have on Canada uh, nationally. So we really cannot afford to not think this through at this point. So, sorry, again, I'll be speaking in English. Zach was saying uh, about Canada being a regional power without a region, I think mm -hmm. is one of the old saws of, of Canadian foreign policy and Canada as such. Uh, I think the, the, the response you received, Jonathan, about uh, joining the United States, well, ever since, you know, we've had public opinion polling in this country, there's, a, you know, 8 to 10 percent people who say, yeah, that might be a good idea. So let's say that this is, I don't know, 60 percent. The U.S. would say no. Congress would never allow Canada to become part of the United States because, you know, Bernie Sanders would be mm. the president. <laughs> and, 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 and that would be a problem for a lot of Americans, most of them, in fact. Um, and, and so... I, I think here, I, I, I just, I, I fail to see how, if there's a problem uh, in, uh, in investing in the country, uh, thinking all, uh, you know, keeping all the scenarios open. So the scenario in which you have, we have, you know, actual decoupling with China, you know, the breaking of the whole supply chains and everything, you know, let's not tr just ignore China the way we ignore the Soviet Union. So that's, so that's probably an extreme version. It's not going to happen now. I think I agree uh, with, with those who have argued that, you know, some vestiges of liberal international order remain. They're going to remain for a little while longer. And that's, that's, that's a good thing for us. Everyone's argued that's it's been a net benefit to Canada, uh, and, and no one's, no one's going to argue otherwise, unless you're, you know, on the far left or on the far right. Um, uh, so, but, you know, thinking about scenarios, right? that's what strategy does. Uh, you know, that, that's, you know, good strategizing. We don't currently have one. Cynics would say, well, in Canada, we don't do strategy. Uh, uh, but, well, that's not true. I mean, we, we, certainly the state apparatus does, uh, the military does. Uh, there are so many institutions that do and do it really well. Um, the question is, you know, do, do citizen voters, uh, you know, can they catch up? Can they follow? Well, Earlier, we talked about security literacy, why this is becoming so important, right? What is cybersecurity, right? Does this mean, does this mean the government should have a common cybersecurity strategy, federal government, not just, you know, parts of it? No, coherent security strategy at the level of federal government. Well, you know, we, we are getting there. Now, whole of government, right? Now, the citizens, I mean, it has to be kind of both uh, wide and, and deep. Uh, this security literacy, and that this this can hurt us, and and part of that literacy is thinking about options in a world in which the United States is behaving erratically or radically, as it did under Trump. Uh, I'm I'm maybe not optimistic. I I don't know. Most of my household is American. We we talk about these things <laughs> every day, um, and it's uh, yeah. The prospects are generally bleak. Why? Well, because you know, the, 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 the stronger political party in the United States right now has decided that the, the best way to win power politically is to play with fire. And they're going to keep doing it for the, for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Yeah. 
I think that our alliance with the United Nations is one of our key strategic interests. I don't think it's an either or situation. You're not either a client state or independent. But uh, I think we need to be more pragmatic. I think uh, the Trump presidency was a major wake up call for our country and our government. We can no longer simply wait for Americans to support us on everything at all times. There's another major wake up call was no doubt the DeMichael case uh, with the arrest of Megwin Zhu and who was then extradited to United States. And that was uh, the beginning of uh, this very unfortunate situation. So once again, I think we need to recalibrate that relations, but we have to look at the benefits and how can we reposition interest? What do we draw from this relation? What do we need? Why do we need this? And do we always have to be hand in hand with the United States on all issues? I don't think so. I think that we have more leeway than we think. I think we have more freedom than freedom than we think. And what we've also learned from the Trump presidency is that when at the high level of the executive, uh, things don't work out between the PM and the president, the work between the uh, departments, United States and ours are well established. It's there, we can work. So military collaboration continues. We have cooperation that's been well established for years and that allows for a certain amount of stability in a time of crisis and a certain amount of security, but we must not fall behind it. We must continue to be credible. We have to invest in our capabilities that are both important for the United States and for us, and they serve both our country's interests. We had the discussion about continental divestment uh, and investment. These become extremely important points. And I think uh, it's something that we were once again, and time again, criticized for. Yes, uh, we were criticized under Trump, but previously as well. So once again, we need to see where our priorities lie. What do we invest in? to establish that relation to make sure that it uh, is sustainable and that it will also be able to overcome a further time of crisis. But over the past five years, I think this has led us to think about the fact that we need to diversify allies. We shouldn't put all our eggs in the same basket. We can't wait for the United States to always defend our interests and to not do that. We need to establish strategic partnerships with other states whose interests we share. And it's similar to economic relations. Uh, we don't necessarily see that just from a military strategic point of view, but we need to have these alliances and allow us to really overcome crisis times uh, or when we find ourselves in a situation where we don't necessarily see eye to eye with Washington. Yeah, I, I don't, we can't be autonomous. Um, we can't achieve uh, autonomy from the U.S. Um, it's just not practical. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm quite practically thinking. So when, when, when we look at, um, you know, which of the great powers to align ourselves with, I think the choice is made. There is no question uh, which great power we're aligned with in terms of interest, values, geography, everything everything that we would want to talk about. So then the question is, how do you um, maintain some uh, degree of independence in that dynamic? Um, and I think, unfortunately, we've picked the wrong path. You know, we, we, we suggest that, uh, obviously, the way to, um, to retain some form of independence would, to be, would, to be do so, would, would be to do so from a position of strength, whether it's diplomatic, uh, military, or uh, or economic, um, and I think we'd all agree that we uh, we lack strength in many in many areas, um, and I think that's the fundamental thing that Canada could do to improve our overall situation, irrespective of whether uh, the Trumpists take over the United States or or um, or the Chinese and Russians become more dominating, you know, say in the Ukraine or in Taiwan, it, it, it doesn't really matter. The, the thing we need to focus on is our, is our strength, um, our strengths maybe, um, and mainly those that are 
uh, in relation to the United States. Um, how do we act independently? You know, we, we, need to, we need to focus on NORAD, as you've suggested. We have some technologies that are Canadian uh, that we could invest in that would contribute significantly to continental defense, uh, both in terms of, um, ma mainly in terms of domain awareness. And, and yet, uh, in the current dynamic, um, it's, it's the Americans that are pushing to invest in these technologies. It's the Americans that are pushing to install these technologies uh, on our territory and theirs. And, and I just suggest that we're a little bit behind. Um, and we are having very uh, good and very positive discussions about continental defense and where it needs to move. But I think that's where we could uh, walk the walk, if you will. Um, and we could have real strength uh, as a partner in that alliance, and then potentially also, uh, you know, gain strength in and, and gain influence over some of the things that we don't like about the direction or the choices that the Americans make. Um, you can't do that from a position of weakness, um, and I think unfortunately we've ceded that ground uh, for uh, for too long, and that we're well behind uh, in any sort of uh, effort to make up that ground. I think it needs to be a key focus, a key strategic focus, and I, and I, um, and I thought about what you said about our recent election. And again, I, 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 um, I'm not political by design. However, I was quite dis disappointed that foreign affairs and security, remember the Monk debate was canceled. I was quite concerned and disappointed that that didn't raise more uh, concern across Canadian public. You know, we're very, in, we're, we're very inward looking, um, and I think it's to our detriment. Thank you. I think Zach wanted to bounce back on that. I'm not suggesting that there is a world that exists in which Canada is not an ally of the United States. I'm, I'm saying we have two options. Either we decide we have a foreign policy or we don't. That, that, that's what I'm trying to say here, right? So, you know, if we, if we don't, that's perfectly fine, but we have to accept that there are trade-offs, uh, and one of those trade-offs is we have to stop thinking of ourselves as a middle power and stop wasting resources on diplomatic campaigns and the like. We could still defend in that situation, in that scenario, you know, very rigorously our independence on trade policy, for example. It's just we wouldn't have a foreign policy, right? Now, if we choose to decide that we have a foreign policy, you know, then yes, we're still an ally of the United States. It just means that on diplomatic issues, we're not always aligned all the time. It's not a question of, of being aligned with Russia and China or the United States. We're, we're always going to have the United States as our most important partner. The question is, do we submit our interests entirely to those of the United States and view other powers exclusively as a threat? Or rather, do we acknowledge that there are challenges with rival powers, but nonetheless we try to find a way to incorporate them into the existing international order and acknowledge that there's no solution to the question of international order or international organization without dealing with them? For example, the question of, of climate change, many other questions, right? If we worsen our relationship with China uh, in, on many fronts, including on the security front, it may make cooperation on climate change much more difficult because the economic competition is going to be a part of it and it's going to make concessions on those issues a lot more complicated as well. So, you know, there are ways in, 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 a, in an instance in which Canada works hard to develop its own foreign policy independence, but can do so in a way in which it demonstrates, number one, that that is an asset to the United States, the way that it was during the Cold War in many respects, but also that we can be not a liability in geostrategic terms by spending much more, for example, on continental defense in the event that we choose to prioritize the independence of our diplomacy, but nonetheless show that we're committed in the military sphere to continental defense. So in, in each one of these scenarios, there's some trade-offs, and we're going to have to find one way or another to, to maintain some maneuverability and to maintain you know, our, our, our commitment to demonstrating that, that you know, we're, we're an important uh, you know, uh, asset to, uh, to, to the United States in some respects. Uh, but definitely there is no reality in which the U.S. is not our most important partner. Right? It's a question of, of degree is what I meant to highlight. Très bien, merci. Uh, on va passer maintenant à un autre thème. Very good. So moving on to a slightly different theme, but of course it's connected to the broad theme. The general was talking about the, the conflict in gray areas. We're talking about this more and more hybrid conflicts. So for the Taiwan uh, issue, uh, many observers, for example, believe that if China were to make a move uh, to try to uh, 
to win back this uh, reticent province, it would be done differently, notably cutting off electricity uh, through cyber attacks, trying to create chaos within Taiwanese society to destabilize it, to bring out friction and tension within that society. Is Canada ready to, fa to face this type of conflict in the 21st century? How can we adapt to this evolution? Also, do, do the, the Canadian forces have the means to be a significant player? Zach, you have, uh, General, you have the floor first. So your last point, uh, does, the, does the CAF have the capability of, uh, of responding in a, uh, to a cyber threat or a cyber actor? Um, it's early days. So we have capabilities, and uh, some of them are niche uh, capabilities, um, and, um, and we have uh, knowledge in this space. And we're very much interested in, in more, in, uh, in improving our capabilities. But I would say that we're well behind some of our uh, allies. And uh, in particular, we're well behind our competitors. Um, and we're behind in terms of the capabilities, not only, but we're also in behind in terms of our willingness to act. Um, in terms of offensive, counter, uh, offensive cyber operations, uh, in particular, uh, our regulatory structure uh, impedes us, as you would expect a democratic regulatory structure to do. Uh, it impedes us where an authoritarian regime has no such impediments. Um, and so we've got a real hill to climb with our allies in this space. Um, and actually, funnily enough, space is another one of those areas where we have a very similar uh, problem in that the 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 uh, the competitors, our competitors, can work with inside what's called our OODA loop. So it's a, a fighter term from the Vietnam era, uh, but it's basically they can get within our decision cycle, and they can stay within our decision cycle, and that means they can attack us um, and undermine us almost at will, um, and and that's a that's a very significant problem, um, and I think that uh, Canada will have to and is. Uh, Focusing in on this problem, but but frankly, we it's early days, and we and we don't have uh, solid answers or or truly a solid plan way ahead. We have capabilities, um, but uh, but we need a lot more investment. Not and I'm not talking investment necessarily of finances, but in investment of thinking, investment of uh, time, uh, and then also investment of resources in order to uh, address this uh, growing threat. Just to build on what the general was saying, when we talk about hybrid warfare and gray area, or below the threshold warfare, that's my preferred term. So not real conflict theater, but hostile measures to our interests. I think it's important to recognize that our competitors are ahead on our in, in the capabilities, but they're not facing the same constraints as we are in terms of authorities, policies, and uh, de deployment measures. So what they're doing is based on the authoritarian nature of the regime. How do we use the same tactics without losing our, demo our, our democracy, our democratic nature? And that raises all kinds of dilemmas for a democracy. How do we ensure accountability and transparency uh, of these cap capabilities in a security and operational environment where the threat is sometimes uh, imminent and sometimes we don't know that we're under threat? And it raises all kinds of questions. It's more than about training uh, 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 p people developing new tactics or acquiring new technologies. I think it, it's uh, cross-cutting in government and institution. We also talk about a new area of operation. Again, we're behind on our rifles. We should talk cro uh, about cross-domain uh, attacks, aiming and targeting different Canadian 
uh, interests at the same time across domains. Sometimes we won't even know that it's an, a hostile activity against our sovereign uh, interests. Because of that, we, we have to keep uh, an approach through the Canadian Armed Forces, but also pan-Canadian working with the domestic partners of the other national security agencies, but also other departments that don't necessarily play a role in security. I'm thinking of uh, foreign investment uh, abroad. Uh, it's even more difficult looking at Canada because we have several levels of government and, and, and stakeholders. And to understand, I think that that article, the, the, the Arctic is a good example because our presence is not as clearly established as in the South. Our awareness capability is not as developed and that's why we invest with NORAD and uh, in continental defense, but also but there are several vulnerabilities, our historical contentious relations with the northern populations, the lack of infrastructure, uh, our difficulty to uh, respond to emergencies in the area, uh, make it so that the north is more vulnerable to attacks that could have serious implications for the rest of the country. So when we talk about the uh, gray area conflict, we really have to start thinking in a more holistic way be a lot more innovative in our approach if we look at them strictly from a tactical standpoint i think we've lost it already <clears throat> so i think we have to be able to see beyond and change our approaches and that's a hard thing to do because for decades now we've been dominating with our allies the operational environment now we're in a situation where in the gray world we don't know where when we're threatened when we're targeted and how we can respond or defend against such attacks so beyond developing capabilities it's about changing the paradigm in the way we conceive of canadian defenses well uh, this table uh, and and this will come inevitably after the you know next national security strategy which is what 17 years old now uh, so that's good. I mean, that, the way I see it, it's very good to have that basic agreement. Uh, I mean, on, on uh, gray areas, hybrid warfare, uh, Zach earlier mentioned 2014, when it kind of was, you know, the beginning of, of, of what we're talking about today. I remember for me, it was August 2008 and Russia's war with Georgia, and also the, obviously the beginning of the Great Recession. I mean, that, that, that gave us a preview of what was coming. Already then, it became clear to some uh, that you know, this thing, this, this love affair with a so-called liberal or rules-based international order may not last forever. Uh, I mean, not a profound uh, kind of insight, but still, uh, we, can, we can date it back to 2008. Um, on, on cyber, I mean, I, I keep saying about, you know, we, we, we could work on a, on a cyber strategy here uh, in Canada. Why? Well, it, it affects everything in security terms, but also in terms of industry. Uh, I mean, this, this pencil is subject to a multi-tier supply chain. I mean, this, this ball pen, even a pencil, if I, even if I, was, if I was holding a pencil in 1958, I'd still be saying this is a you know, multi-tier supply chain product. Imagine a, a weapon system, any weapon system, the F-35, for example. So, you know, since we, some of us in this room have written on this quite a bit. Um, I mean, right now, we are looking at, uh, at, at a review in the United States of, uh, of such things, right? You know, a fighter jet, uh, a, a, a warship, uh, whatever you want to call it. And, and all of it, all that is being produced now and in the future has to be subject to something called CMMC, Cyber Maturity Model Certification. Uh, the US has passed this, now the DOD expects every company that's part of its global supply chain to be CMMC uh, certified, right? I mean, or worthy. Uh, that's probably something that we're going to start adopting. Why? Well, because we have a single North American defense base. We've had it since 1958. Uh, uh, Australia and, and the UK, the members of AUKUS, uh, they joined officially in 2017. Uh, we've been you know, officially part of the, I guess, uh, national, uh, t uh, I guess, North American industrial base since 58 or 1942 or wh however you want to date it. We've been, we've been doing this for a very long time. This is coming, whether we like it or not. The question is, how do we 
talk about it, and how do we integrate it in the rest of what we'd like to be as a country, right? And, and so uh, we come back to this question of security literacy, why this is important, why we need to talk about it more, and especially universities have a large role to play. Uh, you know, even when it comes to simple things such as, here's how you open an email. Uh, you know, this is what you click on. This is what you know, you know, you're not supposed to click on these things. I mean, we, we assume we know these things, but you know, first year students don't know. They get in trouble all the time. Uh, and, and so that's where the conversation begins. And then it scales up to, to questions of, you know, sovereignty, national cohesions, values and interests and so on. Uh, and, I, and I think that that's very important and that sensitizes us to questions of, you know, hybrid warfare, uh, our interest in Taiwan, you know, and, and, and so on. So I'll just say, say that. Well, I'd like to say something that might be unorthodox about this, because lots of people in the think tanks like to talk about hybrid war. I don't like that rhetoric, the hybrid war, for several reasons. Firstly, I don't think it's a clear enough concept. So we involve a little bit of the cyberspace or little green men, uh, but it's not really a concept that is a holistic uh, uh, for a strategy. Uh, the, the strategies of these powers, including Russia, sometimes resemble strategies that ha have already existed for centuries. I don't know if Ryan Evans is still there, but Michael Kaufman wrote a great article a few years ago yeah. war on, for War on the Rocks, characterizing Russia's strategy as raiding. Raiding has been used since the Middle Ages. Now we're in a transitioning world order. We need new terminology and people are trying to conceptualize this idea of a hybrid war. But sometimes the terms and the strategies that we already know are more useful than trying to reinvent the wheel. That's my first thought. Secondly, hybrid warfare comes from Russian terminology. That's something that Putin was saying long before we started saying it in the West. He was saying that when the West was criticizing them about policies, politics, or human rights, or when the West was using economic pressure on the US, that was a hybrid war against Russia. And in repeating this terminology, and now we're using it, we're sort of using Russian propaganda without being aware of it. Uh, so I wanted to say that. Thirdly, when we use this rhetoric, it's even though we're in a period of peace, it's as if we were in perpetual war. It's a hybrid war. It's an unending war, uh, specifically, uh, uh, precisely. And it's dangerous because it creates a logic, a dynamic within. We continue to rebalance towards a growing threat. And then it's a zero sum game with other powers. And I don't think it's a by accident now that we're on the verge of a war with China and Russia at the same time, eight years after the beginning of this type of rhetoric uh, in the West of hybrid wars. It's not a good idea to just repeat that over and over to say that we're in an ongoing war, even when we're not. And lastly, I think it's worth thinking about the terminology in the particular case of Canada. As I said earlier, it's, it's very commonplace for Canada to import terminology from the US or Europe, and then we repeat it and we start saying, what are we gonna do about this, that, that hybrid wars and so on. But Canada is not, is not that important a country to be a target of hybrid attacks from other major powers. Uh, yes, we have challenges, but let's not imagine. And that's a problem we have in Canada. Canada's back. Uh, don't know if you read Adam Chatnick's recent blog. He said Canada is not so important that its announcements of its comings and goings actually matter on the world stage. So geographically, we're pretty far from those other theaters. We, we need not fear little green men and so on. Uh, not really. And even if we were came to be targeted by Russia uh, for elections, are both uh, major parties are anti-Russia. 
more or less. In China, there's one party that's trying to have a balanced position towards China, and the other, the Conservative Party, is much more virulent, hawkish uh, towards China. That's something else. But uh, in the case of Russia, uh, it's not going to change anything for Canada. So I think it's worth it for Canada to think about its own interests and to rather underline the, our traditional interests, a traditional analysis, and that means defending the North American continent, putting forward uh, traditional diplomacy in the other theaters, and not succumb, succumb to other terminologies that are not necessarily aligned with our own interests. So, Zach, I, 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 uh, so, I like that point about uh, we're not going to get the little green men in Canada, but, uh, but, but I would say that fundamentally the, um, the cyber threat uh, threatens our Five Eye Alliance. Um, because if we don't secure our systems, if we don't secure our, our equipment and our country, then, then that would undermine the very critical uh, Five Eye Alliance and then potentially also our access to um, what the AUKUS um, um, uh, three uh, create, you know, in, in that space. So, so while, the, while the Russians and the Chinese might not be threatening us directly, um, if they can threaten the U.S. Uh, through us, and that's uh, then, then that's equally as bad. There's one one thing that uh, uh, Gail said as well, uh, which is now becoming um, spoken about by the commander of uh, NORAD, Northcom, um, and it's this idea that in this world of uh, of operations in the gray space, that uh, that we have to think about things as a country much more um, in in a much more integrated fashion. So um, he's coined a phrase called integrated deterrence. And what he's referring to is that uh, deterrence is no longer a military-led uh, posture where the military has nuclear weapons uh, that are facing off against the other country's nuclear weapons, but rather a whole-of-government effort uh, where um, domain awareness is one of the pillars, uh, but uh, resiliency is another one in particular. Resiliency of our civilian infrastructure, of our national infrastructure, uh, resiliency of our of our elections, you know, as basic as, as that. Um, the Russians don't only act with little green men, they also conduct very focused information operations against us, and they practice. They practice, they don't necessarily do it uh, for a particular purpose, you know, at a per particular time, but they practice, and they're very good at it. Um, and, um, and, and it poses a significant threat, but, it, but, I, but, I, but I agree with you, the Russians aren't going to come across and invade Canada anytime soon. There was another the way of understanding the question and, and to understand Canada and to what extent Canada is ready for these threats, but to what extent the Canadian forces are able to help our allies or friends uh, when they face that type of build the threshold intervention uh, just below this, the threshold, just under the threshold. I don't think we found a better ex French expression uh, than under the threshold. Uh, thank you for your interventions, one and all. Uh, we have... Uh, 15 or 14 or 15 minutes left rather and i'd like to open the discussion up uh, to the floor uh, your excellency thank you can you hear me yes because you guys focus on security and i haven't done that my whole career and therefore look at the great powers and of course we're smaller than the u.s thanks we are but in the world we have a hell of a lot of weight and we have a hell of a lot of weight, uh, partially because we're so close to the U.S., people listen to us, but because we're separate and different from them. So we have to stop being so Canadian. Our GDP uh, per capita, we rank about 40 places ahead of Russia. Russia's not that strong. They invested in their military, so they're being pretty pesky. But honestly, we've got some weight. 
So uh, we do matter and we can change things. So it does matter. And then I wanted to um, talk about international law for a second. Of course, there are layers of international law. But it was almost Lavrovian, the analysis up there saying, well, because international law is broken or because it was written only by the West, uh, it's it, it somehow corrupted. Well, it's not true that it was written only by the West, including at the beginning, but much more so now in the very democratic fora like Yunga, ECOSOC, etc. Um, and it doesn't function like domestic law. It's not about what's written. It's about state behavior. And the whole point of international law is to force conversations where states have to justify what they're doing and then to shame them. Shame us, too. So there, you have to bring humility to the conversation about international law, but throwing it out is a really, I know nobody was, but it, it's a really dangerous move. We need to keep using international law as that forcing function to call states to account, including ourselves, and that's okay. So I think that's the way to focus on it and understand that when we do, we're not just parroting Washington think tanks. We're using a tool that has served us for a very long time because we've had an independent foreign policy from the beginning and we will always continue to. So that's my rah-rah Canada speech. <laughs> now I feel better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, would you like to respond to this? Uh, no one? I mean, Good? Thumbs sure, up? Well, maybe, yeah. I mean, uh, what, what, what does it mean? To be can when you say we're so Canadian, <laughs> Canadian about this, so it's very pejorative. Could you define it as a concept? <laughs> what does it mean? Peru? No, plus que plus que ça. C'est no more than that. Small. Proud of being humble. Mm. <laughs> okay. And we should actually just revel in what we're good at because we're good at a lot of things and we carry some weight and stop being proud about our humility. As we discount, we end up discount. Others might start to believe our own bad press that we give ourselves, and it's, it's, it's not the way to go. Okay, uh, Zach, and then uh, you'll have the next question. Go ahead, you can uh, respond. Sure, I mean, uh, I, I, you have a much greater experience than, than I do in, in the deployment of Canada's uh, resources on, on the global stage. So. Uh, the way that I just sort of th see things today, I, I don't see uh, Canada as having at least the influence that it once had, and maybe that is just the you know, inevitable consequence of the rise of other powers, but having lost two consecutive bids for a UN Security Council seat under two different parties being in power, it's hard to see the multilateral dimension of Canadian uh, foreign policy holding the same uh, weight or even you know, uh, representing the same sort of uh, potential for the advancement of Canadian interests the same way as it once did. Our relationship with the United States, uh, you know, as well, is not what it used to be, very much unpredictable. So those two major pillars of sort of a special relationship with the U.S. and multilateralism serving as a means of distinguishing ourselves from the U.S., but also solving global problems, it, it just seems to me like we're not really there to the same extent that we used to be. We can't rely on, on either of those uh, anymore, uh, at least, you know, for the time being. And it is a fact that, you know, we have only... 50-odd peacekeepers deployed in the world today and that, you know, our international aid has declined and that we sort of thought that we were entitled to the Security Council seat because we're Canada. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just not so optimistic that we hold the same amount of influence. And I certainly, I mean, irrespective of the fact that our, you know, GDP per capita is far superior to that of Russia, I would not say that we are a more powerful or influential country on the world stage than Russia. Is Russia, by virtue of its not just military power, but geography abuts so many different theaters in which it can project power. It's not afraid to use force, which is part of the reason why it is so influential. And it's going to remain a great power for decades to come. It is. I know we like to think of, of Russia as a declining power. We don't have to listen to what they have to say anymore. They're basically just going to go away, or maybe when Putin's gone, you know, they're just going to join the West and embrace our values. That's not true. Russia is going to remain Russia. It's going to remain different from Europe. It's going to, uh, even though it's to a certain extent a part of Europe, it's going to remain different from the West. It's going to remain a perennial challenge. And I know we all want to pivot to China and put China first and focus exclusively if, uh, you know, on, on China. But Russia is going to be there. And Russia wants to be heard. And Russia wants to be uh, you know, sitting at the table and playing a role in determining whose rules uh, you know, are shaping the international order. 
And if we want to focus exclusively on China, Russia will make sure that we're not able to focus exclusively on China. And that's the final point that I'll make on the question of, of international law, et cetera, versus the rules-based order. We hear all the time in the West this notion of we need to defend the rules-based order. And again, I support this notion in general of a rules-based order. I'm sure that whatever emerges from the current contestation of great powers will be in some respect a rules-based order. In fact, by definition, every order is to a certain extent based on some sort of rules, some sort of predictability. The question is what kind of rules, whose rules, etc. But the reason why we in the West say all the time we need to defend the rules-based order is because it's a deliberately vague term. If we said we all need to defend international law, well then it would be very easy for the Russians and the Chinese and others to point to all the times that we violated international law, which we have, Canada less than the United States, but nonetheless. So we, we obfuscate things by saying the rules-based international order, which makes it easier for rival powers to claim that basically this term is a term that we use to, to you know, as a political football basically to, to whack other, other powers with. Um, I, 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 anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but. Um, there we go. I, 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 I don't know, if, by the way, if the comment was directed at me about sort of Lavrovian uh, analysis, but um, you know, I, I did do my PhD thesis on Russian foreign policy, and these are my views. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not Russian views. So uh, I just wanted to, to get that out there, uh, that, that I'm not parroting Russian talking points here, just to be clear. Thank you. Uh, Chantal? Can everybody hear me? Thank you very much uh, to this panel. Many interesting points have been raised. My approach is that Canada should avoid using certain terms in language that we use in the United States. For example, under Donald Trump, there was a Secretary of State who said that the greatest threat for the United States and American allies is the fact that we're facing the possibility that the world will be led by a white world power. So obviously there is racism here. So that is, we can only be governed by a Caucasian power. So that's one thing. And secondly, there's a lot of propaganda. In the 1970s, for instance, Richard Nixon recognized and established relations with Mao's China. It was some 75 million people who died under Mao. So this China uh, was less aggressive than it is today, but today, that's hard to say, but today, today there is a debate underway in the United States and by John Usheimer, for example, and they're saying that the United States today should reach an agreement with Putin's Russia. And why is that? To act as a counterweight to China. And if you look at the EU's behavior as well, I think there Canada could also act because even before Biden, the EU had decided to go forward and to reach a global agreement on investments with China, even though Joe Biden's administration had asked us to wait. But the question, yes, please, please ask your question because we're ending in four minutes. So I'll let that aside for the time being. Let me speak to something that the general said about Taiwan. He said China could invade neighboring countries like Taiwan. But if you read Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State of the United States, he acknowledged that Taiwan had refused an American proposal aimed at recognizing two separate states because Taiwan recognized that the continental China was part of it and China recognized the same. But today, would it be in the interest of Canada to become involved in a war against Taiwan if ever such a conflict would break out? I'm sorry, perhaps my question was somewhat lengthy, but I just wanted to make a few comments to shed some light on 
Canada's position. Well, since we're running out of time, we also have a question from Zoom. If I may, I'll ask the question and perhaps you can ask a, answer the question of your choice. It's Pierre. According to you, what are the weaknesses of Canada and its qualities that Canada can call on to efficiently meet with its strategic interests? So up to you. You have three and a half minutes to answer. Surgeon? Well, I'm going to attempt to answer the question uh, just posed. Hegemonic contestations, you mentioned hegemony earlier, so it was wonderful to see a little bit of IR theory in the, in the first round. Hegemony, the way we use it in IR, it's leadership of an order. And so it's never complete. It's always a process. What we're seeing now, I would say, are two hegemonic contestations that are mutually reinforcing. So one is the Cold War stuff. We talked about that earlier. And that's between and among states. That's how we at least understand it uh, in, in IR theory. But then there's another one that's uh, across and within states and nations. And this has to do with uh, uh, political and ideo ideological struggle for uh, what should constitute the good life in a given community, right? And so for the first time ever, probably, you have someone uh, in the Trump administration. Uh, her name was uh, Karen Skinner. She was the director, uh, deputy director in the policy planning division of the State Department. She said, you know, this is, this is new. We've had hegemonic transitions in the past between states and empires. But this one involves a country that's not majority white. It's not Caucasian. Right? This has been said for a very long time in IR, uh, just not publicly. And this is the first, <laughs> first time someone said it publicly. It was in the Trump administration. And I think she's African-American, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so, so this, uh, you know, I, I think, I don't know if she kept her job for very long uh, after that, but it, w it was seen as a, as a very problematic thing. And, you know, everyone wrote an op-ed saying, uh, we can't have, uh, you know, this language in diplomacy or uh, official representations or anything like that. And here in Canada, we had something very similar. Uh, in, 2000, in January 2000 and, uh, 2019, um, with, uh, when, you know, when the, the news of the two Michaels became news, the kidnapping of two Michaels became news, the ambassador, Chinese ambassador in Canada, Lu Shai, said the same thing in the Hill Times, published it, and said Canada suffers from you know, excessive white supremacy. Uh, the, the way you understand international law is a white supremacist understanding of international law. When was, when was, the, when was the last time an ambassador said that in, in any context in, in you know, modern diplomacy? Never. And I remember talking to two experienced China hands, Agag, and they said, you know, this is a translation issue. No, it wasn't. It was part of what became later warrior diplomacy. Right? So you have forces in Washington and in Beijing who are very interested in using this kind of language which we see as terribly undiplomatic. But it is the way to stoke the fire of the culture war, mm -hmm. which is the mechanism of keeping yourself in power or winning power. And this is, this is part of the hegemonic contestation that we should be having a discussion about. This is becoming the technology of rule for some people and some institutions and some forces. Sorry. Thank you, Surgeon. Uh, we have to end this panel. It's 3.55, unless you can respond in 15 seconds or less. Uh, I would just say something about Taiwan. I, I think Taiwan stands out as, a, as one of the few democratic nations, truly democratic nations, if we, if we give it that title, nation, uh, in that uh, part of the world. And if Canada isn't uh, willing to defend a democratic nation, then I, I would question our values um, in that space. And All I right. think this is exactly where our interests and our values might enter into conflict. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much to all of you. It was great to be the moderator on this, uh, for this panel. Thank you again. And uh, now I would like, oh, yes, you can applaud these people. Good job. Very good. <laughs> Stephanie, the floor is yours. I'd like to take this advantage to, uh, to I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our presenters. Uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful day. Um, 
À quoi s'attendre après le colloque? Euh, évidemment, so, il y a eu de merveilleuses idées qui ont été partagées aujourd'hui so euh, dans les tables rondes, des, dans les discours. Euh, on va speeches. mettre en ligne des capsules pour mettre euh, en vedette les intervenants. To showcase our speakers as well, there will be publications. There will be more than 39 in 2022. We can expect uh, clips uh, and uh, documents that will be shared more broadly. So far beyond our community that is here in person and virtually. As well, I'd like to thank those of you who are in the room or who are listening to us at home for having taken the time to do this. I know that this is a very busy time for everybody. It's right before the holidays. And we are very grateful for your active participation in this because this has really missed us. These kinds of events uh, have uh, something or something we've missed. This is a new formula. It is a hybrid conference and it is of great value for us. And then I'd also like to mention that in January, February, March, we're going to be holding three back to back workshops organized by none other than your moderator for this afternoon, Jonathan Paquin, Sarah Myriam Martin Brulé, aussi Marie-Ève Desrosiers. And Marie-Ève Desrosiers as well will be part of that. So let me give you a few directions for the reception we'll be holding downstairs for those of you who are with us virtually. Uh, we hold you in our hearts, but uh, we go to the heritage room. Left. Uh, je vais remercier aussi le programme Main. I'd also like to thank uh, the Main's program and the symposium, but also for uh, the Network for Strategic Analysis, and also thanks to uh, the team that organized the Connection program. Holding this kind of event is really made possible thanks to them, as well as the UQAM Faculty of Political Science and law that is uh, presenting us public this health rules will apply as they have here uh, et donc, uh, dernier... so once again thank you very much to cidp team at queens for having contributed to organizing the logistics for this conference so thank you very much and uh, we'll see you downstairs and for those of you who are at home hoping to look we're looking forward to see you again soon and thank you very much for the successful symposium and uh, we'll see you soon